Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Axon started out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. Imagine having 100 years of tire and wheel knowledge in your back pocket the next time you sell a piece of ag equipment. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. This podcast is also brought to you by Valley Transportation. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransinc.com for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is also brought to you by AgDirect. No matter how you buy your ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Moving Iron. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Sean Hackett. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. If you need a new pocket knife, uh, send an email to marketing at axontire.com and they'll send you a free Alliance Tire branded pocket knife. Um, and you tell them that Moving Iron sent you with all your details. They'll drop that in the mail and send that right over to you. So if you need a new uh, pocket knife, just send an email to marketing at axontire.com, and our friends at Axon Tire will send you a free pocket knife. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs at Valley Transportation. Our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy your ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance, and you can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Sean Hackett is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida, and Sean is nice enough to come on the podcast and talk about what's going on. So, Sean, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm trying to uh, get get a, a nap here and there while I can. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine you got, you got a lot of stuff going on all right now, I bet you. Um, yeah. Well, we did have an email come in from a listener, and Julian sent this in. And uh, anytime you have a question for Sean or anything on the podcast, just send me an email at Moving Iron Podcast at Moving Iron Podcast dot com, and I will uh, get it out here. So the question is: All right, so Julian was wondering why uh, there was a limit up move in wheat yesterday, but there is also a limit down move in December wheat on the same day. We have to understand there's two different crops. There's the old crop supply, which is the March, uh, May, um, and July contracts for corn, soybeans, and wheat. And then you have the new crop months, the, the crops that are, that are going to be pricing in the following year's crop, um, which is your September and December contracts. And there's been a marked difference. The more you pump up the nearby price, Casey, the more bearish it is actually for the deferred price because it emboldens the producer to plant more more than he might have planted otherwise. That makes it, sense. It, 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 it takes that marginal buyer and says, you know, I'm going to try, I'm doing something else. I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that corn right now. I'm not paying that price. Um, you know, everyone seems to think that somehow if wheat's $12 versus seven, that the demand is not going to change. Of course it's going to change. It's going to be down. Um, and so we, you know, we, it's not transparent. We don't really know how much there is until later, but you know, when you're looking down at the end of the year, the demand destruction that's currently occurring is going to show up. Um, the market's obviously betting that this, this altercation, this invasion in, in with Russia and Ukraine will be remedied by then, or will be largely, uh, whatever is going to happen, but you know, it'll, it'll be, it will be under some kind of a new normal, but it won't be as uh, intense. Something will be resolved from this whole thing. The market's betting that by the end of the year, this will be resolved in some shape, way, or form, however that is. So all these reasons are suggesting why you know, there's a lot of excitement. Remember, when speculators come in, these big funds with these big capital, you know, they're not going to go buy the deferred contracts. There's not enough liquidity. They want to be able to get in, and if they change their mind, get out quick. Um, and th- th- that liquidity is represented in your nearby contracts, your first couple of months 
that are trading. That's where all the open interest is, all the volume is, and, and that's why that's where they're going to play their speculative games. And so all that supports a pumping up of nearby price at the expense of the deferred price. Now, now if we get into the growing season, Casey, and if, we're, if I'm correct about a, a, a difficult planting season, a chaotic, a chaotic planting season, and the market worries about the next year's crop, now those deferred prices can actually start to outperform significantly. But you know, we're not there yet. We need to get into April before we might see that shift around. So, so that's the best that I can come up with. Um, as to why, and, and it actually makes perfectly good sense. Yeah, so. it makes, makes real good sense. All right, so on that same topic, to get segue in, into what my next question was, you put out a report yesterday on you know, uh, sudden uh, stratospheric warm events that you've been talking about for a while, and we're looking at March uh, right now going into mid-April. And uh, if you look around, in my, especially where I'm at, we're, we're starting to see some of those effects where we've had this very mild winter up to this point, but we get these huge... Um, blast of cold air you know we'll get a you know three or four day blast of uh you know it'll go from 50 degrees down to you know negative five and it'll stay there for three or four days and it'll jump back up to 50 degrees we're supposed to, we're supposed to go through the same event again um over the weekend moving into next week and uh we're seeing a lot more moisture in in our forecast than we'd seen in the past yeah it's interesting i mean it, we look at population weighted heating degree days that means it, it you know don't get me wrong. I mean, somebody lives in Wyoming, okay, but not a lot of people, okay. It's just five hundred thousand so, of them. So, <laughs> so, so there's not a lot of consumption that's needed to heat people in Wyoming if it's minus forty degrees. Mm -hmm. But if it's you know minus twenty degrees in Dallas, well, I mean, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, so we try to look at what's called population weight. That means they weight they weigh the cold weather based upon where it's occurring. And what's interesting that even though like your area has missed some of this cold, it's been on the edge as we've been talking about. Um, if we look at population weighted heating degree days, we're like the second, third coldest winter in 25 years on a heating degree population weighted basis because Northeast has had a lot of cold. Um, the uh, South has had a lot of cold. The East, a lot of, even the West and early in the winter had a lot of cold, but, but it, it hasn't been a, what we call a, a, a persistent cold um, constant. As you said, there's been a lot of back and forth, but it's still been a very cold winter because we, we, when it goes warm, it's warm for a few days, and then it flips to cold for a few days, and it flips to warm for a few days, and it flips to cold for a few days. It's been, but, but having said that, I do think we're going to get into a more uh, nationwide persistent pattern, and you're starting to see that, especially in the center of the country now, where you've been missing mm -hmm. a lot of this cold and snow. You're going to start getting it on a, on a regular basis, and one of the things that's happening is that. The one thing that we've missed this whole winter, Casey, is that we we haven't had a, a, a sudden stratospheric warming event other than late October, which was too early in hindsight to make a difference. We are in one right now. That is where the stratosphere over the Arctic warms suddenly and displaces the cold air mass and changes the polar vortex orientation. Uh, that will peak next week. And then we're going to actually see the stratosphere split into two separate polar vortexes, meaning you're going to, the circular polar vortex is going to split into two, think of it like a cell division. This single cell is going to become two cells in the stratosphere. That's the second signpost that the, that the polar vortex is getting extremely unstable. The last thing that has to happen to create this polar vortex is now that stratosphere is all messed up. It's split apart. It now needs to connect or link up with the troposphere, which is the lower atmosphere. So the lower atmosphere right now is fine, but the, upper, but the stratosphere in the upper is all messed up. And if you get the troposphere to also split like the uh, stratosphere has, that's how you get the polar vortex. That process of taking the stratosphere, linking it with the troposphere, takes about 30 days on average to get that linked up if it's going to do it. That means that we are looking at late March in the mid-April for that connection. And we can see the troposphere coming several weeks in advance. If we see it coming, we'll be talking about it on your show, Casey. And, um, and that means that April is going to be winter, not spring. In the meantime, in the meantime, though, in the meantime, we're still going to have a lot of cold weather here in, in March. Even though it's not a quote-unquote polar vortex event, it is still extremely cold air because of this disruption in the, in the 
polar vortex that's being created. We're going to get a lot of really cold air. And the bigger, and then, and the thing that's really going to be a, ch a change, we're going to get a lot, a much big increase in overall stormy activity, blizzard activity. And if we do get a polar vortex, we could get one of these bombogenesis winter hurricanes, they call it, where, you know, you, you, you go from, you know, you, you, you get almost an, an intensification uh, of a storm within 24 hours and it, and it just dumps crazy amounts of snow and high winds and all that sort of thing. We think that's really likely to be set up here, um, you know, later on in, in March and especially into April. And we've commented before that, you know, a, 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 a blizzard or a bomb genesis storm in April, you know, you, you'd almost have to go back to, the, to April of 1973, which was to this day the, rec the, the largest, most intense blizzard we've had in the Midwest. And that set off one of the greatest disjointed spike trades in grain market history, quite frankly, one of them. So, uh, so that's what we think is, is on the docket. We're going to be monitoring this, but we're, I guess the point I'm trying to make from this is we needed an SSW event to occur. It is. And then we needed to see that this stretcher was going to split into two. It is. And now we have step three is link, link with the troposphere. We're going to be hounding on this and, and, you know, looking at this daily to see the early signs that that's going to be happening. If it is, you know, then we're going to have a wild, wild ride this spring uh, in weather, in markets, in energy, and a lot of things. So this this geopolitical skirmish that's created some pretty wild volatility may not be the end of it. You know, we may actually have a weather-related uh, round of this as well. So Awesome. Okay, so on top of all the stuff we see now, with, so if you stack that up on top of what you see happening, um, if you have a, a late playing season, then you, we still have some issues in um, – the Black Sea getting stuff in and out of there. Um, like the blow-off top stuff you've been talking about, not that it's already blowing the top off, but it could become more of a, a hard line blow-off the top type of situation moving into that uh, spring that spring time frame. Our best guess, you know, and this is a guess, you know, geopolitical is difficult, but our best guess is there's going to be some softening of this. I was, I'm not saying resolving. It's going to be some softening of this situation Something's going to happen to calm things down. Even if it's just a ceasefire, we're going to talk for. If you remember the trade war, you know, every time we said we're going to go talk, um, you know, the grain markets took off. <laughs> right. And then every time it, it failed, then they crashed. And every time we went to go, well, I, I think we might just be a point where like, we're going to go talk for a little while and, and, and it's going to cause a big sell off in the grain markets by the, as these speculators try to get out of this short term trade. I think that's likely going to happen. Remember, planning intentions are coming at the end of March. And with all this bullishness, you know, the market might be worried that we might get a, some acreage numbers that are going to be pretty large. Um, and so the market also might be wary of being too bullish heading into the uh, planting intention for it. And normally everyone gets bearish at going into the planting season because no one is anticipating that we're going to have a problem, right? Everyone's anticipating, well, Plant is going to go great like it normally does. So, oh my gosh, we're going to plant 500 million acres of corn. Oh, this is terrible. So, so I think the best forecast we can make right now is some kind of a give back here into this playing attention port, some ceasefire, some negotiation, some, you know, you know, maybe we can work this out. And then, and then we have to trade the weather event. And that still comes down to trading this blow off top that we've been talking about that we actually forecasted 18 months ago that we thought would happen in this, in this, springtime window now whether that makes a new high whether it's just a retest of the current highs you know we just have to see how all these pieces play but i do think you know there's going to be a second wave of volatility on trading this weather and then from the, now i want to be very clear though i do see pretty good weather i see a good finish to the crop this is not a drought cycle here this is not a year we're going to look at 100 degrees in in, in, uh, in august and soybeans burning up, we actually see a very good July-August weather pattern, a really, really strong finish. So we're going to start off terrible, but we're going to finish strong. So whatever reaction weather-wise we need to make, we, we think it's going to be very much front-end loaded. Um, think 2019, how we had a very good finish, and, and we kind of pumped everything up, and then it was, it was down for the rest of the year. Um, we're not really feeling we're going to have a, a, a difficult growing season once we get past the planting season. Right on. Okay. 
Well, Sean, it's a little shorter than normal, but I feel like it's a pretty good place to stop for the day. So if folks want to reach out to you and get more information about what you're doing at Hackett Financial, uh, what's, what's the best way to do that? Our website is Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors.com. You know, we have our information on there about our smart money algorithm, our natural climate cycle algorithm, and other things that we utilize to make some of these longer-term forecasts to see maybe if that would be a value your listeners right on well sean appreciate you being on the podcast man thanks casey you'd love to be here right on i am casey seymour with moving our podcast make sure you check me out on facebook twitter and instagram that's where you find the latest edition of the moving iron podcast also all the blogs get posted there as well go to moving iron llc.com for every moving iron podcast episode all the blog posts as well as everything having to do with the moving iron summit coming up here in nashville tennessee that's september 6th 7th and 8th so if you're interested in doing that you need some more information you can send me an email at movingiron.summit at movingironllc.com and I'll send you an email back about what's the, about answering your questions or you can just go online there see the see all the speakers and those kind of things if you're like Julian and you have some questions that you want to have Sean answer or any, any of the guests answer here on the Moving Iron Podcast uh, just send me an email at movingironpodcast at movingironpodcast.com and I will make sure to ask that question for you so with that I am Casey Seymour with Sean Hackett let's move some iron folks out Axon Tire is going to have more tips, tricks, and client advice throughout the year and in September at the Moving Iron Summit in Nashville. If you're looking to sign up for the event, please head over to movingironllc.com. We hope to see you there. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransitinc.com for all of your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving iron in the 21st century.